NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is following the Harris campaign from the White House. Matthew Dowd was chief strategist for George W. Bush's 2004 campaign and is senior MSNBC political analyst. Adam Gentleson worked for the Democratic senators Harry Reid and John Fetterman. He's also a Democratic strategist. Great to see all of you. So, Matt, Trump is not happy about these new numbers. His campaign um, is calling the polling atrocious. What does it do for the Harris campaign to have states like, like Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, even North Carolina in play now? Well, the first, the first thing I'll notice is anytime Donald Trump is attacking the polls, then you know he's in trouble. That's, yeah, and that's the clear signal. Every time he does that, you know he's in trouble. Because every other time, he hawks the polls, says, here's how great I am. I'm going to edit everything. And now he's attacking the polls, including Fox News, which is kind of amazing. Anytime you can have a larger map to compete in on electoral states, on swing states, the better for you. And I would add the only state that was added from 2020 to this year was a red state, North Carolina, that has, has, has been trending toward purple. And so we now have seven states that are in play in the course of this election cycle. And my guess is, and I would, we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks, especially with the debate coming up, what is more likely to happen is of those seven states that the Harris-Walls campaign is more likely to put away some of those other states, maybe in the Midwest, before Donald Trump can recapture some of the southern or southwestern states that he has. And that puts him in tremendous difficulty. So, uh, Gabe, these polls do seem to justify Harris's decision to kick off her post-DNC tour in Georgia. Where do these Sunbelt states fit into the overall campaign strategy going forward? Well, Chris, uh, 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 Kamala Harris and Tim Walls had already been looking at the Sun Belt states for the last several weeks. They were actually there earlier this month, but certainly this new polling uh, seems to reinforce that decision to really expand the map, as you just heard Matthew uh, talking about. This is a dramatic shift, Chris, from when President Biden was the nominee just a few short weeks ago. Kamala Harris now up one point in Arizona, two points in Nevada, but as you mentioned, of course, this is in the margin of error. However, this is highly, highly competitive. And we also see Donald Trump, according to this poll, losing some support in the Sun Belt, again, uh, from white evangelical Christians. That is down six percentage points from what he uh, raked in back in 2020. However, his support among black voters is going up as well. Kamala Harris, though, is also getting more enthusiastic support from black voters, and that is leading uh, to some of that, um, some of the success they're having in that recent poll. Again, within the margin of error, the, the Harris campaign is not taking anything for granted, they tell me. That's why they're in Georgia. But again, there were several states before that were wishful thinking at one point, Chris, including North Carolina, when President Biden was not now the nominee. Now all of those states are firmly in play, Chris. So, Adam, I want to read to you something uh, another Republican pollster, uh, Darren Shaw, had to say about the results of this poll. I'm quoting here. Harris's campaign has accomplished something that seemed impossible three weeks ago. She is seen as the change candidate, despite being the incumbent vice president, at a time when there is considerable anxiety about the state of the country and the administration's ratings are dismal. For the moment, they have remade what was a re-election campaign for Biden into a referendum on Trump. I thought one of the most interesting parts of this poll, more Democrats as a percentage now support Harris than Republicans support Trump, not by a lot, but that is a big change. So if this is a referendum on Trump, does Harris win? Yes, I think she does. I mean, I think one of the things you saw when the matchup was uh, former President Trump versus President Biden was a lot of voters who uh, people classified as what's called double haters. They were dissatisfied with both candidates, and they were basically screaming out for a different matchup. And there was a sense that whichever side listened to those voters first could reap significant gains. Whichever side offered up a different candidate could reap gains. And I think that's what you're seeing. Donald Trump is not only a former president, he's one of the most well-known people in America and, frankly, in the world. So, you know, he is kind of stale. People know what they're going to get with him. They're kind of tired of his shtick. I don't think he's even doing his shtick as well as he used to. Uh, it's gotten old, 
And Harris has brought with her an incredible excitement, a forward-looking vision, uh, a strong contrast on the economy. And I think that's been a really powerful, had a really powerful impact on the race so far. And that's what you're seeing in these poll numbers. So take us behind the scenes of what you imagine the conversations are like um, in Matt, the the Trump campaign headquarters, because obviously now it looks like they're going to have to spend more money, more time in places that they might have thought they shored up, right? Yeah, I mean, we'll take inside the Trump campaign or inside the mind of Donald Trump is like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. So I don't know how much logic we can apply to what's actually going on there, though my guess is there's been some broken ketchup bottles at some point in the course of this. I mean, I think Donald Trump functions well when everything is in order and it's all and he's doing fine and he's dominating and to a degree like he was before President Biden do dropped out. He had all everything going well. The campaign was functioning well. He was raising money. The polls were all in one direction. Now he's in total disarray because largely for what Adam just said is the Democrats and President Biden, to give it to him, they were the first ones to listen to a huge part of the voters who didn't want this choice. And once that happened, Donald Trump had no idea how to function in a campaign that wasn't Joe Biden. And we can see that in the last four weeks. He keeps bringing up Joe Biden as if if he brings up Joe Biden, it'll somehow reemerge and he'll be running against Joe Biden again. He has not figured out how to run against the vice president in this. And that's very difficult. And I would add one other thing in this. He, to most voters' minds, he is the incumbent because he's so ever present, mm -hmm. because he's a former president, and because he's the oldest, longest candidate in this field, he feels to most voters like the incumbent. And that gives a great advantage to the Harris campaign. And that's why Donald Trump doesn't know what to do at this point. Uh, so, Adam, you and I were at the DNC and, and talking to folks, uh, uh, you know, leadership in, in battleground states. One of the things they kept talking to me about was the impact that they were seeing on down ballot races. And I want to give you three examples from uh, this poll. Three mega conservatives, Carrie Lake in Arizona's Senate race, Sam Brown in Nevada's Senate race, and Mark Robinson in North Carolina's gubernatorial race are all losing to their Democratic opponents by double digits. Do you think they're bad candidates, the Democrats are particularly good candidates, or is there at least an element of that Trump and the MAGA movement are becoming a liability for these folks? I mean, I think it's all of the above. I think this is a rerun of what we saw in 2022 when Republicans fielded incredibly poor candidates across a range of highly competitive Senate races. And I think it's happening so often that this isn't a fluke. This is a structural issue within the Republican Party that is downstream of the MAGA movement and of Trump's leadership. They simply cannot find reasonable, moderate candidates to win primaries. You can't win a primary in a Republican in a Republican primary if you are not loyal to the MAGA movement. And so, you know, it's the classic case of what succeeds in primaries does not succeed in general elections. And so you have a structural situation within the GOP where they keep spitting out these incredibly right wing candidates in highly competitive races where they frankly should be competitive, but they're not. I mean, Democrats are, are frankly, you know, running away with it in these races. And I'm, I you know, don't want to get over my skis here. These numbers will tighten. They always do. Uh, but I think Democrats heading into Labor Day, which is sort of the crucial turning point of the campaign, are in a very strong position in all of these Senate races that you mentioned.